Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning or good evening, wherever you are on the world. Um, I'm happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me to the conference. Um, this is a uh, pretty exciting topic, um, patterns, predictions, and programming. And it's all about machine learning with Java. So uh, as the subtitle says there, um, software development is going to change significantly. And as a developer, this is a topic that you should be really, really uh, well versed in. I know there are many other other uh, talks mm -hmm. in this conference on machine learning. Um, this one is specifically about using Java, but it's more about taking a look back um, at where machine learning started and why you should be really interested in it. And it's more than just a, a passing phase. I should point out also, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm associated with the New York Java SIG and uh, representing a group of about 9,000 developers in the New York area. So hello to everybody. Okay, so we're going to talk about machine learning. And this is a talk, if you're, you know, if you've been doing machine learning for the past four or five years, this talk is not for you. This is for people who are new to machine learning and uh, are interested in doing machine learning with Java or even, you know, want to understand the, the, the basics of machine learning and um, different types of machine learning and what's what's uh, all the interest in generative AI with ChatGBT and Palm and Bard and all these other cool tools. And what is this, what, this is the bottom line question. What does this mean for developers, for all of you out there? Okay, okay. so this is a, this is a long, long tail uh, phenomenon. So let's take a step back, patterns of machine learning. Let's talk about patterns. So this gentleman back way, way, way back when, this is like in the 40s, so significantly way back in the past, he had this interesting quote that one of the most interesting things about the world it's that uh, it's considered to be made up of patterns. So this was said in the 1940s. And I would say I would have a Greco corollary is that one aspects, you know, interesting aspects of the universe is that it's made up of patterns. Everything is made up of patterns. So um, besides being a tech geek, um, I'm also a musician. I mean, some of you know that about me. Um, and, you know, if you're a musician, especially if you're a guitarist like me, and if you're a blues guitarist or a jazz guitarist and, and you want to play with other people and say, like, we're going to do a one four five in the key of A or a one four five in the key of C or we're going to do jazz. And here's a here's some common jazz progressions. And a very common one is two, five, one in jazz. So those are patterns. So I've been involved with patterns most of my musical life and I've been playing guitar since I've been child. Um, my undergraduate project, oh, oh, now we're talking about way back when, two decades ago, is where I took um, a melody from, and it was like a melody from pop songs, and I took these melodies and I created probability trees, and then I generated new music from those probability trees. You know, what note was next, most probable to come next and what was next and then and make it so that it wasn't um, boring. We always, we knew what the notes were. I induce a little bit of, or I introduced a little bit of randomness. And then when I was a, a, a graduate student, I I refined that project. This is this is generative AI way, way back when I, when, I, when I was doing this. Certainly not with the tools we have today, but it was using, you know, probability trees and, and fractal um, random numbers and uh, et cetera. And I, and I actually added, um, what was interesting, I, I added a uh, user interface that allowed people to see the notes. I drew the staff out. And just as just for fun, I, I added, uh, I, you were able to transpose it to a different key. So I mean, notes were just numbers. I just, you just add or subtract numbers to, to all the numbers and then you redraw it. It, was, it wasn't a hard thing to do. It was interesting during my master's presentation, everybody in the room was fascinated by my user interface, not not interested in my uh, data structures and in my uh, fractal node generation, but it was uh, more about the UI. So it taught me a lesson about how important user interface is when you do projects for, for people. Um, but that that's my that's my background. Um, I also worked for um, a surveillance company for New York Stock Exchange, um, actually, the New, York, the New York Stock Exchange as a surveillance company. We we're trying to track people who are doing illegal trading. 
And we were looking for patterns, trading patterns, certain patterns in the morning, certain trading patterns in, in the evening when, you know, markets close. That's when they're most active, right? When, when open market, open market close and during the day to detect any illegal patterns, right? These are word patterns. Then later on in my career, I worked for a company you might remember them, Lehman Brothers. Uh, went, went, I was there a week before they went belly up. Um, and I was working on portfolio management. We were looking for patterns in a portfolio. And we were trying to find out, if, if these are massive portfolios, you know, you know, mega portfolios, hundreds of hundreds of millions of dollars, and trying to tell people why their portfolios went up or down and correlation of what was inside a portfolio. So patterns, when I mean, you try to find out why this a causation engine, um, and I used to have long coffee discussions with some of um, some of the interns about causation and correlation engines. And actually some of them went to do startups with the uh, correlation engine. So that, that's uh, that was pretty cool. So there's that word patterns, right? And we're all familiar with this book, design patterns. So this book, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with, was influenced by a talk that Kent Beck and Ward Cunningham in, in the late 80s did at an Uppsala conference. You know, Uppsala is a uh, object-oriented programming systems and languages, right? So this book was influenced by that talk. So it was patterned on a talk. That talk was patterned on this book. This book is about patterns, a pattern language, but not about software. This is about construction, building construction. So it was uh, the book on design patterns was patterned on a talk, patterned uh, by a book about patterns. And this book was so influential that Ward actually created the first wiki based upon this book. And it, and it influenced the, the development of, of agile, agile development. Now this book was patterned on construction patterns. So, and we all know about construction, building construction patterns, right? They certainly have been around for uh, for centuries. So the next the next time you use the decorator pattern or the visitor pattern, you know where it really, really came from, right? So now well, there's other types of patterns. So now we're all familiar with regular expressions, right? There's books on regular expressions. We know that there are, there are languages inside of our Java and you know Python and, and uh, um, C++ programs. We have a language that's in a language, right? We have regular, regular expressions inside of our programming languages. So they describe text patterns. Now that's interesting. Okay, well, where did that come from? Well, so, Back in the early 40s, ne neural networks were, were invented, um, you know, McCullough and Pitts, and they were students of actually um, Wiener, who I, I pointed out in the first slide about patterns. Uh, they were his graduate students. They invented um, artificial neural networks, ANNs, or what we call today neural networks. That was 1943. So Professor Klein on the right here, he, uh, he said, wow, this is pretty cool. These artificial neural networks, um, I need to experiment with these. So he said, well, what, what problem domain can I attack? And he said, well, well text. I mean, we all we'll deal with text. Let me, let me come up with a way of experimenting with machine learning, with artificial intelligence using text. So he invented regular expressions. So you could think of regular expressions as a DSL for ANNs, in other words, as domain specific language to experiment with artificial neural networks. So this is like 1951. So the next time you use regular expressions, you know that they were invented to deal with machine learning. So you're using, when you're using regular expressions, you're doing machine learning. <clears throat> so that's, that's, that's pretty cool. But the point about this is that it's all about patterns, right? Whether it's musical patterns, um, it's in finance, um, it's in fractal patterns, um, it's in business, um, it, animals use patterns. Uh, certainly my dog knows when it's time um, to, to, uh, to eat <laughs> and this one to bother me. 
um, to play. So it knows about patterns when, when uh, you know, when you're playing sports, whether you're playing football uh, or you're playing European football or American football. And of course, American football is where we don't use our feet. Um, and also in astronomy, I have the, the little um, star explosion here, a supernova. So I was really into astrophysics. And I noticed that we're, when I was in um, undergrad, and I noticed that there were stellar phenomena that were patterns. And since I was a musician, I noticed that, you know, stellar phenomenon um, like supernova was like music. Is that there was a period of instability where a star kind of, you know, pulsates real, and then it blows up. So it was like chaos got too big and it blew up and then became more stable. And I thought like, you know, actually that, that explains a lot of things in music, music phenomena. Why Elvis Presley was popular. Why were the Beatles popular? Why did the, the grunge in, in the nineties become popular? Well, there was always, a, it always preceded what, by a period of instability. You know, why was Java popular? So all these things had patterns. So this is actually pretty cool. So here's another interesting thing. So here on, on, the, on the left hand side of the screen, we have um, the graph of, of France and the, um, the train system in France. Those, those yellow lines there. So somebody um, who is investigating slime molds, which are single cell organisms and created like, okay, let me put a picture of, of France and by the cities, I'm gonna put food. I think slimes, you know, eat oatmeal or something like that. So we put uh, food where the cities were and then let the slime grow and slime move quite slowly. So over time, this picture was taken. And it was interesting that the slime mold, a single cell organism duplicated what human engineers did. So this was just mind blowing. A single celled organism duplicated the human brain. So that was, that's, to me, this is like, okay, that's, that's a pattern. That's another pattern. So, so we, so this is all about patterns and what it, exactly is machine learning? It's all about patterns, right? It's all about recognizing patterns in a data set, right? Looking through huge data, you know, a huge corpus of data and either you're predicting something or you're generating something. Right. And here's uh, since we've heard the term generative AI, let's see where, where all this fits. So the, the big um, sphere there is artificial intelligence. OK, so um, something that mimics human intelligence. And of course, you can argue whether humans are intelligent or not, but that's a discussion for another day. Um, so machines duplicating human intelligence and it, it could be an expert system. It could be just a, a graph, a knowledge graph. It could be something like symbolic AI, which was used in the 80s, linear programming. Those are all types of artificial intelligence. Another type is called machine learning, right? And that, that blue sphere. Now, inside of machine learning is where, as it says, where the machine actually learns. It learns from the data. Okay, it learns from the data. It doesn't really have to be programmed in the traditional sense. Now, a subset of machine learning is called deep learning where we're using uh, more advanced things like neural networks and we have cloud computing and we have GPUs. So that's deep learning. But if you read the, the, you know, the press, I mean, we, we're all, we're supposed to be the smart people on the planet. We know that there's a difference between deep learning and machine learning, but you know, in the press, people say machine learning. I mean, you watch television, you, some streaming thing that talks about um, machine learning and, but it mentions neural networks and, and cloud. That's really deep learning, but you know, we're the smart people. We know that, but people, they, the, the, the lay person calls it machine learning. So I just want you to know the difference. Now, inside of deep learning, we have two basic types, right? We have predictive, like the weather, right? You're predicting the weather. You have um, a giant uh, corpus of data. You have uh, a giant model with billions of parameters and you wanna predict the weather for the next few days. Okay, it's predictive. Um, predictive neural networks, predictive deep learnings, I should say. Then we have generative. So you might hear something like there's generative AI and there's predictive AI. One is predicting, 
classifying, predicting, and the other one is generating new things. And of course, that's what's really popular these days with ChatGPT and BARD and Llama and all these uh, interesting things. And, and machine learning is all about pattern recognition. So that's this is for for us techies, right? This is this is the world. But sometimes when you when you watch you know a streaming thing and they talk about machine learning, they they really might mean generative AI or predictive AI. Okay, so this is way different than traditional computing that we've been doing for decades. So at the top, that's traditional programming. We've been doing this for, for years and years and years. We have a, a data database and some, some uh, repository of information, and we have the model that's in our head, right? We have the model in our head that we're going to write some program. Here's the algorithm. We're going to create it, and we got a result. Pretty, you know, that's pretty much what we've been doing for like 50 plus years. Now, on the bottom, this is very simplified <clears throat> but machine learning is a little different so in machine learning we have a lot of data and we know um what we want as a result and we want the machine to create a model like basically what program do i need to to generate this result so it's almost like inverse of traditional programming now to be really accurate machine learning there's two phases there's a first phase where you take data and you want to look at for patterns. So you want to catch the patterns in your data and you create a model. That's the first phase. Once you have a model or a collection of models, the second phase is that when you use the model, now you have new data. How does the new data compare to my model? So you typically have the training part, the training phase. That's why it's called machine learning. The learning is in the first phase. The second phase is when I have a model and I have new new input, new data, and I want to compare that against the model. So machine learning had, had basically has those two phases. And, and, and typically the model is saved in a file. Okay, now let's talk about uh, one of our favorite languages, Java. So we, we know that, you know, people tell us that you have to learn Python to do machine learning, right? And you know, you have to know about data science um, and Py Python is a fantastic language for data sciences. I, and I know that when I worked um, on Wall Street, we we use things like S plus and R and those languages. Those were fantastic for creating models. And I worked with the, with the quants, you know, the the, uh, the data scientists of the day back then. And they were modelers and they I wouldn't classify them as real as programmers, but they were modelers. Yeah, but then to put it into production, we had to put them in production in C and C++ because that's still the way that our production environment was. But you don't have to learn Python. Python is a fantastic language. It's a really, really cool language. But there's there's a lot of, there's 12 million Java developers out there. Okay. So a colleague uh, of mine, uh, Zoran Savarts um, and I, we wanted to promote Java for machine learning, right? We, this is going back like four or four or five years. So what we want to do is, is create a friendly Java environment to do machine learning. We didn't want another, what I call a doomsday scenario with JavaScript. And I, and I mentioned that because we had the web invented, right? Invented back in the late eighties and, and uh, early nineties when it got really popular. There was only one language for this fantastic gift to humanity. And we had one language to express all of our creativity. So imagine if you're a musician, a collection of musicians, and I give you a kazoo. And you have to, you and your, your bandmates have to come up with a song, and you all have a kazoo. And you have to express your creativity through a kazoo. Can you do it? Yeah. Sure, you could do it. it. Are you really expressing your your thoughts and, and your creativity through that one instrument? No, not really. I mean, I'm really a sax player. I'm really a, a drummer. I'm really a guitar player. I'm really a bass player. And that's how I express my creativity. So we didn't want another doomsday scenario. That to me was like ridiculous. We should have multiple languages for machine learning. Not just Java, but many languages, right? And Python's a fantastic language for for people that do create models. It's it's a great language. It's certainly uh, um, very popular. And I know from being an instructor that a lot of people, while they might 
try to learn data science. I know that a lot of application developers are not going to feel comfortable doing like matrix manipulation or, or any other statistical um, learning statistics, statistics, right? It's the average application developer is not going to be a data scientist. I know it's, it's, it might be a hard thing to say, but there's only going to be a small amount of data scientists and a lot of other people using the model. I mean, just to me, that's common sense. But with Java, the, the existing APIs are not friendly. Um, so Zorn and I, we went to all these companies around uh, around the planet, and we said that, would you be interested if there was a decent Java API for machine learning um, for, for your production teams? Every company we talked to, we had in-depth conversations with everybody, and then even Brian Getz, uh, one rainy day at QCon in New York, I had discussion with him about, about this. Certainly everybody, it was 100%, everybody wanted Java for production, right? Java for machine learning in production, everybody did. So I said, you know, this is pretty cool. So we need to, to come up with a, a friendly API. So instead of trying to boil the ocean, we came up with a subset. Let's just tackle visual recognition first. So we, we did uh, JSR 381, which is approved. So that's a formal standard for Java for uh, visual recognition. And, and here's the, uh, the JSR, JSR 381. And there's where you can get the, 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 there's the repo down at the bottom. So while there are ML APIs for Java, what we found is that they were, they were hard to use, right? They, you had to know about C language. You had to know about pointers. Right. You had to know about GPUs. You had to know about low-level stuff, and of course, you know, their Project Panama is is going to address that in the future. But when we started four years ago, there wasn't anything to use. They while they were Java, they weren't Java friendly. Right? We wanted we were you know both Zora and I are Java champions, and we understand that you know what it means to be Java friendly. You know, you have to. There's conventions in Java that you have to use, and we wanted the average Java developer to feel comfortable. So we created this API. It was um, much much easier to use, and there's the uh, the link down at the bottom. You can screen snap that and and take a look. It's a lot of fun to play around with. All right, here's here's our architecture. I, mean, I don't want to dwell on it too much, um, but it the the, um, the public API, the little orange brownish thing up the top that's that's the api that we created and all the rest is like our internal playground that we that we created for um for that public api and like like all other jsrs it's an api okay it's an api so we sit on top of server service engines like at the bottom we sit, sit on top of engines it's so all jsrs are apis so we sit on top of whatever ML engine is underneath. And one of the engines is Deep Nets. Uh, this is Zorin's community edition um, of his machine learning engine. So let me go back to this one slide. So one of the ML engines at the bottom is Deep Nets. Um, another one is, um, is Amazon. One is another one is TensorFlow. So we had, um, here's, here's um, an article in InfoQ where Amazon implemented our API using their DJL, their deep Java library. So you can feel comfortable with using JSR with, with uh, AWS using um, Amazon's DJL. So, so when they did that, we knew that we were successful. Our idea was successful. You know, when, when the Amazon team implemented on top of that, okay, we know we had something. So we were happy to help out a lot of Java developers. So um, I'll hold off, see if I can do it demos at, at the end. Um, but here's here's basically how it works. I mean, typically, I, I've sort of grayed out the um, the full um, process, the, the full workflow for machine learning, where you prep the data, you train, you create a model, you train the model, you test the model. So you're in a model uh, in the center. Make sure the model is is uh, giving you your results, and then you put in a production on the right. So we're gonna we're gonna kind of skip the the middle part, and certainly this is not drawn to scale. If this is drawn to scale. The data prep part on the left would be probably the size of my house. <laughs> that's that's the hard part is, is making sure the data um, is is unbiased. It's clean data. It's it's there's a lot of work there. 
Um, and also something you left out of this is how do you version models? And how do you know a model is correct? These are all things that you know people forget. They want to talk about the sexy parts of machine learning, but these other production things you, you have to worry about. So let's let's just do something real quick. So let's say you want to uh, do visual recognition on uh, pictures of dogs, and you want to uh, here's these nice cute chihuahuas, and I got the uh, this data set from from Stanford. So I, I had a small data set, real tiny. It was 872 images. So I, I trained a model using pictures of light colored chihuahuas, right? And here's our API that it's a little it used to build our pattern. Um, you know, here's our images. Um, here's the path where you find the images. Here's a label that says that these are chihuahuas, um, a few other attributes, and then build a model. That's all you need. Okay, now I have the model. Now here I have four new pictures. Four, you know, I created with with these pictures, and here I have some new pictures. Uh, you know, Chihuahua one, Chihuahua two, Chihuahua three, and then I have a picture of a mushroom. See if it detects, you know, uh, a, 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 not detect a mushroom, but detect that it's not a not a Chihuahua. So once I have a model and I save the model in the file. I have another program that reads in the model and, and looks at those images and makes a prediction. So this is using predictive AI. So that this is really easy. You you create the classifier. Say like, here's a builder again. Um, here's a model file that in red, and that's all that's all you do. And then you get the images and you say like, give me the predictions. And the result is that the, for the first one, it says that the one is a mushroom, 66, and the next one's 87. So basically this. So those are the probabilities that those are chihuahuas. Right? Chihuahua one, that's, that's a high degree that that's a chihuahua. That's a high degree of chihuahua. This is 87.8%. That's a chihuahua. So that's pretty good. But then they get uh, 66%. That's a Chihuahua. That's certainly not a Chihuahua. So when I when I first did this, what the lesson for this is that I didn't have enough data. You need a lot of data to get accurate results. So while this is saying it's you know it's above 50%. So so this told me that 872 images was not. But this is just um, something for production. You add more images. You train the images on light colored chihuahuas you might have dark colored chihuahuas that may be a different data set so that's um that's a simple jsr 381 example and and there's you can do a screen snap of this and how to get started we've had a bunch of developers do kind of real cool interesting things like detecting uh star wars tie fighters <laughs> so there's a this is a a, a good getting starting guide so it's, it's a lot of fun actually all right and, and here's a uh, whole bunch of other links that you can you can use to get started so when you get the slide deck you can you can visit all this stuff okay now let's talk about um generative ai and in, in the next 15 minutes uh i'll see if i can summarize this so what do you think the fastest growing programming language for this year and, and next year well let's see this is uh it's not java it's not C++. It's not Rust. Let's see what it is. So let's uh, let's dive in real quick to uh, language models and OpenAI and all kinds of cool things. Okay, so we know what a model is, right? We just went over what a model is. So what's a large language model? Well, it's a model. that We talk about models, but it, it understands natural language, right? Large language models. And that's certainly with ChatGPT and... And, and uh, this latest craze with uh, with um, machine learning and generative AI, like I pointed out before, it's it's a, a form of deep learning that generates something new based upon the model. And certainly, it's been around for a while. As I said, since it's been around at least since the seventies, the late seventies. But the big breakthrough was in twenty seventeen when Google's um, ML team came up with a, a software architecture called the Transformer. 
which um, allowed parallelism and allowed um, vector, uh, ve um, vector um, utilized vectors with GPU. So that was a huge advance. And then 2017, it was a paper by eight Google researchers, uh, seven of them, which are not there. They probably thought like, wow, this is, uh, is going to be big. I'm out of here. So that was a big breakthrough in 2017. That's why everything after that just, you know, blossomed, the whole machine learning thing um, blossomed. Right. So we, we all know about ChatGPT and OpenAI and, and the relationship with Microsoft. OK, whether it's open or not, that's, that's another that's another discussion. Um, apparently, uh, OpenAI started as an open source company, but it was, became closed source. But that's a again, that's another coffee discussion. So <clears throat> uh, ChatGPT, right, GBT, generative pre-trained transformer. So it uses a transformer architecture, it's generative, and it's already pre-trained. So that's why it's called GBT. Um, and ChatGBT, everybody uses the, uh, you know, all of your friends and relatives use the uh, 100 million of us use the user interface at the web app, right? But there's also an API. But OpenAI has uh, the text-based things that also have image-based uh, set of APIs and whispers and other another set of APIs. And you can kind of categorize them like this. I didn't see this on, on their website. They had their, their little logos here, but I wanted to make it clear. So there's there's chat completion, um, you know, like a, a, a chat bot. There's another set of APIs that do uh, summarization, gener to analyze things, um, manipulate text. There's code completion, right? And remember, so code is like, it, it's a language, right? So it's like a, a a speaking language, except it's for code. And it's actually a, a, a small subset. I mean, speaking language for all humans is, is a hard problem to solve, right? The code is certainly a smaller universe. So it's pretty good at, at code completion. And of course, we know about Dolly, um, which is image generation. Honestly, I think some of these other things like mid journey uh, are superior to uh, image to Dolly, but um, they have Dolly and then they have whisper, which is speech to text, which you would kind of imagine if you're dealing with text, speech to text would be kind of a useful API you have. So I have that. But what's also interesting is that they have these two other things here. So you, um, they offer a fine tuning API. So if you want to, uh, if you ever have an existing corpus of data, right, you have a huge data set, maybe you have your own company documentation and you want to um, train or tweak what ChatGPT says based upon your own data, you could fine tune it by introducing your data into ChatGPT using what's called fine tuning. And a lot of people are interested in that, right? The specifically tweaked for your data. And that's where you're fine tuning. There's also embeddings where you can, um, the, the way all of this works is that you want to find similarities between things, whether they're text, they're objects, you know, images, they're like, how is something related to something else? Well, you we have images, I mean, how is that image related to that? Well, you can go by color, you can go by shapes. So these embeddings, an embedding is a, is a vector, it's, like, it's an array. And it's an array of numbers. It's obviously machines deal with numbers better than, than than text. It's it's a way of representing things, whether they're text or images or colors or things, in terms of numbers. And that's how you de determine relationships, how similar this is to that, based upon this this set of numbers, because you can do arithmetic numbers to determine that, right? So that's, that's really important in embeddings. That's how all this works, right? It's a little collection of embeddings, right? So we know a little about ChatGPT and it's, you know, based upon tons of data, um, but public data, whether this represents human intelligence or not, that's another story, um, but it's, it's, um, it's, it's uh, created from all this, all this data sources here. And there's, there's a paper that kind of talks about this. It doesn't, the OpenAI 
paper. It doesn't tell you exactly what other data is used, and they're very secretive about that. So, um, but the, basically, that's those are the data sets. So, we're all programmers. We're interested in the API, right? So, I, so was I. It's like you know, last year I was interested. So, my first question to ChatGPT was, "Give me a small curl script that accesses your API," right? That seems like a, a perfect first question to ask. So I, I got back uh, something like this. And I said, oh, this is pretty cool. It, it generated a whole entire curl script. So I, I copy pasted it into you know command line. And there's an API key you have to have, of course. It's it's not foo foo bar bar. It's, you have to get that from OpenAI. It takes you like a few, few seconds. Well, it takes you 24 hours to get an account. Then you generate a key. But it didn't work. And it's like, well, that's really weird. It didn't work. I said, well, this is kind of, you know, it's, you know, it's generating garbage data. And so I had to kind of go into the documentation. I had to uh, RTFM <laughs> to read the documentation. And I changed my curl script to, to make it work. It was a little tweak. And so I got it to work. I mean, basically what you have to do is that you have to, there's this little language that you have to send, this messages language, this last line here. So I tweaked it. I thought that was interesting. But then I found out that OpenAI only knows about information before 20, uh, September 2021. So it didn't even know its own API because the API was updated since 2021. So all the updates were not, it didn't know about it because that's not, that's, it wasn't trained on it. So it, it taught me, it taught me a lesson. It, it, so ChatGPT doesn't know about things that occurred before September 2021. But I eventually got this curl script to work. It's pretty, pretty simple. I usually, you know, do a simple curl script. If I can get a curl script to work, then I know I can get it to work in any, you know, any other language. So there's my curl script and it generates, you know, I said, I want this actually, yeah, application JSON. So I want a JSON output. So I got this nice little JSON thing here. And in red is, that's, that's my, that's my response to my question. So that's called a completion. So, so the first one is that the prompt is, what is the joke of the day? And the completion to the prompt is, here it is, why did tom tomato turn red? Because it's sort of salad dressing. So, and then I, of course I, I piped it through JQ just to make it um, human readable. That's all JQ just does. It's just pretty prints the JSON. So then I wrote a little program. So let me duplicate ChatGPT in, in a shell script just to, just for fun. So basically it's a little loop down here and I send the curl script to it and I get the input from the user. So I, I want to duplicate ChatGPT and you know, duplicate just for text, not for images or, or uh, anything else, but just simple, simple text. So that worked, you know, it gave me back, you know, I can type things in like, hello, tell me a joke, you know, template for inviting a speaker to a conference. So it gave me all, you know, all this cool, cool information. So I thought, ah, this is pretty cool. But then, but then you could do stuff like this. So um, you say, I want you to act like something, like act like somebody here. So act like a stand-up comedian and I'm giving it instructions. So I'm programming it. I'm programming ChatGPT and telling, you, telling it how to respond. And I said, I want to, I, the, the prompt is, I want a humorous take on, a pro, on Java. But I gave it a preamble. I, I, I gave it a preamble first. So this is the prompt. I want a humorous take on Java. But I, the preamble is that here's how you can, you can answer it. This is important. This is really important. How about this one? Okay. I, I said, I want a script that describes a conversation. And I give it a story. And I tell you, I'm sort of like setting up ChatGPT. Like, here's what I want you to think about. And I want you, here's the, here's the actual prompt. Create, I hope, you can, I hope you can see my mouse, create a conversation around this topic. You know, what is what is the one of the actors in this script thinking? How does he feel? So I have a preamble to my prompt. So when you create a, a prompt, you typically don't do a one-shot prompt. You set You set up the prompt. And then you tell it. So if if Chat GPT is not giving you a good answer, you have to you have to program it. You have to give it context. But that's how you program it. 
And and uh, the API is it's quite simple. Here's here's the page for the API reference. I mean, you have to get a, a key. So when you, once you get an account, then there's on your account. Uh, it's not here. I think when you when you go to your account, you um, look up settings, and there's like you can generate a key, and then that's the key that you use to to access uh, ChatGPT. And there's all these other all these attributes and it's a simple rest interface it's 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 not difficult um and there's there's a page for for the api and instead of using the uh the one that the the non-tech people use here's the here's the playground so the platform open ai com slash playground and here's where you can pick the model there's like last time i looked there's like 72 different models you know People are using ChatGPT four. That's one model. There's DaVinci. There's all, literally there's over seventy models to use, and they all have different attributes. You know, some are for texts, some are for images. Um, the one for images, there's several of them. Uh, some of them are are fast and cheap, and I mean cheap. I literally mean cheap. Like they're inexpensive. Like DaVinci three is very cheap. If you use ChatGPT4, it, it's just it costs more money. So if you're doing development, you might want to use something close to being free. So like DaVinci 3 is like dirt cheap. You know, I think I spent hours and hours, uh, many hours in, in a week. And I think I paid like 30 cents. <laughs> so it's, it's dirt cheap. Uh, and then you can adjust the, the parameters. So this is where you want to play, you know, you use uh, to test uh, ChatGPT. Yeah, I'm certainly you can use the, the simple the web app. Okay. Now the, here's a Java, a, the Java API. So, so there is no uh, open AI Java API per se, but it's a rest interface. So there are several developers out there in GitHub land that have created um, APIs. And the first one I used was one from this little cat person. Cause I thought it was, well, it's pretty simple. So I used that and here's a little Java program that just a little loop. And it gets input and it says, you know, send a prompt and get a result. It, it was trivially easy to use, but it didn't cover all the APIs. Like it didn't cover the uh, uh, fine tuning API. It, like I couldn't upload a file to, to ChatGPT. So while this was really easy to use, it had some shortcomings. I mean, I think he's, he, the, the, this developer is working on updating. He's constantly updating it. Um, there's another one, <clears throat> Theo. Can Oops, I'm sorry, Theo Canning. So, so um, if you want to go to GitHub and, and look for that that guy, Theo, he has a more comprehensive. It's a little more difficult to use. It's not that difficult. It's just a little more, a little more difficult to use than than the other one. Um, but his coverage of the API is more comprehensive. So he covers the um, embeddings API. He covers the fine tuning API. So I would suggest, you know looking up for Theo, it might be a little tricky to, to use it, but it's not that hard. It's not that hard. So here's a, another Java version of the chat GPT user interface from the command line. Right. And, and uh, one of the, the New York Java SIG leaders, Rodrigo Graciano wrote, uh, it, it took some of the code that I had and just put it into, into spring. So we had a little interface, a web interface. So, I mean, I think what took Rodrigo like 15 minutes to do that, it was pretty easy to do. So you, this is how on your, on the server side, you can access open AI's chat GBT and then use that. Like a user might want to ask a question of your corpus of data. You have some documentation, some your, your corporate data, and then you want some developers to ask questions. This is how you do it. Right now. Okay. Um, how about for code? So instead of English, let's try code. So here's I write a Java program that says hello world. And uh, here I, I, here's the result. Oh, oops, sorry. Here's the result of in, in red of that. And it's a little Java program. So just like English text, I can ask you questions about code. Now, how about this one? I want to create a program that takes PDFs, right? I have a bunch of PDFs and I want the text in those PDFs, and I want the text extracted, and I want to put them in separate files and it's in a directory. And I want to name the files with the same name as a PDF, and I want to put 0102. So somebody gives you that requirement, so how long would it take you to write that program? So you think like, well, okay, it'll take um, two hours. 
And in two seconds, I got this from ChatGPT. I said, give me another version, another two seconds, I got this. So it's something, something that you, it's a tool. Is it correct code? No, you have to look through this, but it's pretty helpful, right? So you have to learn how to create these prompts. I know I'm running out of time here, but you have to learn how to create these prompts. And some of these prompts can be quite sophisticated, right? Here are some, some prompts. You can say, what does this unit's command do? Write the Java, write Java FX program for me. These are tools for you as developer. So you have to understand about prompt engineering. This is really important. So the fastest programming language for this year, next year, it's English. This is how we program. This is like saying, you know, it's a, a program language because it is. This is the fastest growing program language. So I'm going to end with this, that you have to, you have to learn about these tools. If you don't learn about, so AI is not going to take your job, but somebody using AI is going to take your job. So you have to learn these tools if you want to compete with other developers. Um, so that I'll end with that. So thank you very much. And I hope you have the, a good rest of the day. Thank you.